Hello everyone, I'm Lisa Zembrode, Principal and Senior Director of Schneider Electric Sustainability Business. I'm joined by James Hunt, VP of our Power Systems Business at Schneider Electric, and we're here to talk about the Sustainability Index Report 2023. Welcome to Sofa Chats. James, I was just going to ask you, so we, we've just had our, our big launch and a fantastic event where you were the keynote speaker and talked a bit about some of the findings of the report. And I was just curious from your perspective, what's What's maybe one or two things that, that you found really interesting or that resonated with you from the report? If I reflect on the report, probably one of the things that stands out to me is the number of customers that have an ambition, but not yet a path to get there, right? So there's 70% of customers that have an ambition of net zero, but only 50% that have a path to actually get there. So there's that gap that they need to work on. And then probably the other one was the number of customers that are still yet to make a step towards digitization and automation, right? So there's still a lot of people, two thirds, using kind of manual processes for data acquisition. And I think when we look at the energy transition, we look at energy flexibility, we look at demand management. One thing we know is that they're only going to be possible with digital solutions. Absolutely. And one of the things that, um, that I, I found that you talked about it, uh, during your keynote, was really the requirement of addressing both sides of the equation, right? Addressing both the supply side and the demand side of the equation. Could you tell us a bit more, tell our viewers a little bit more about why it's so important to address both supply and demand when we're thinking about sustainability? I look at it in the context of sustainability that neither of them on their own are going to get us there, right? You can switch to renewables, but you've still got transport, right? You can you can switch to renewables, but then you need to be able to manage flexibility in the distribution network, right? So you have to focus on generation. We have to move from coal and gas to renewables, but we also need to focus on demand side solutions because that's what's going to enable renewable penetration. And then also you've got the pillar of energy efficiency where we're still one of the poorest performers in the OECD on energy efficiency. So we need to act on that, right? The more energy efficiency we have, the less new generation we have to build. That's kind of one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is we're working against what is a, a shortening timeline, right? You can't put all of your eggs in one basket. Renewable generation, excellent. We'll reduce the carbon intensity of our electricity supply. That's fantastic. But that's going to be reliant on a lot of new build, which means land access. It means transmission lines. You can't do that on its own because there is some risk associated with it. Um, in terms of demand management, that's easier to deploy. We know how to do it. The technology exists. It's just a matter of scaling it. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. I think one of the things as well from the from the report that really res resonated was the thought process that goes behind the monetization of demand response and um, demand flexibility. And one of the opportunities with that that customers or end users might have in taking advantage of the flexibility or building more capability and have flexibility in their load to enable the greater penetration of renewables and the greater uptake of renewables in the grid. But one of the things that we, we talked a little bit about or that we uncovered in the report is a need for greater investment. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts around um, the, the need for investment in the, in the grid or, or for customers to, to make progress. Investment in the grid, yes, that's going to happen. Um, it may be poles and wires, but it may be capability to manage flexibility instead. So it'll be a different kind of investment. Uh, in terms of customers investing, if you're going to go and put in energy efficiency projects, or you're going to put in on-site renewables, or you're going to put in EV charges, that will require investment. I, I think whilst there is a good payback and economic rationale for making these investments, you can't get past the fact that it will require investment. To achieve these savings, to implement these measures, you are going to have to invest capital. And then I think it comes back to how businesses look at that investment. Are you going to put it up against the same metrics you would for investment in a new production line? Do you have the same expectation on ROI? Or do you have a different expectation on ROI? Do you um, have a carbon price? Do you have an internal carbon price? Uh, are you factoring that into your decision-making process? Um, so I think that's a really interesting point is it is about investment and capital is going to be spent. There are a number of ways that customers can access that. They can source additional funding, but I think we need to get away from the idea that energy savings come for free. Yes. Maybe one last question. Um, 
So we know that the companies who are really recognized as impact makers are, are companies that tend to create enduring positive change through taking a multi-dimensional perspective on the issues at hand. I'm curious, is there someone that, uh, so rather than a company, is there someone that you find is, is an impact maker in terms of sustainability that, that you find inspiring? Look, I, I think if I had to name a person and there's, there's so many to choose from, it's kind of hard. Um, but I would say uh, Paul Pullman in, in taking a business and seeing the need to drive a change and that change to go beyond just energy efficiency and become a driver for the entire business. Mm. And, I, and I think the work with Net Positive is a reflection of that. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Paul Pullman, I've seen him speak twice live, actually. He's incredibly inspiring. It, live, just just as much alive as and, he is. And to take a step like that takes courage. I think that's what I'm most impressed by. Boldness. Thank you very much, James. It was a pleasure having you on Sofa Chats. Thank you.